afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Way Forward Workshop Leader Lunch Break. I think we're all about ready to hop on a plane and head someplace beautiful and warm and sunny. Today, we welcome Bryant Davis. He just celebrated his five month anniversary at the helm as the director of port control for the city of Cleveland. With that title comes responsibility for Cleveland Hopkins International Airport. His first day was May 24th, just a few days after the first Aer Lingus flight flew nonstop to Ireland. That is the first of many changes he will witness as he is tasked with jumpstarting the city's $2 billion 20-year master plan to transform Cleveland Hopkins into the world-class airport it should be to serve our region. He brings with him over 25 years of experience in aviation management from across the country. Long Beach, California, Shreveport, Louisiana, Detroit, Boise, Atlanta, and Palm Springs. Most recently, he served as director of aviation for the Port of Oakland, California, with an airport team of 200 that welcomed 10 million passengers last year. In accepting the role at Hopkins, he acknowledged that this point in time is the opportunity for real transformation, not only in shaping and stewarding a landmark project, but expanding the footprint with nonstop service. Nonstop service is something I know everyone looks forward to. In his off hours, Bryant can be found driving his 15-year-old Saturn View, dubbed the Dust Buster, around his old Brooklyn neighborhood. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Marianne. And, and I have to say the Dust Buster has been retired. <laughs> it's been retired as of Saturday. Uh, it, was, it was difficult to part ways. Uh, but, you know, we had a great 15 and a half years and I just felt that the time had come. So uh, so I just wanted to let the group know that that the Dust Buster and I are no longer together. <laughs> but Good morning, but congratulations. Yes, thank you very much and, and appreciate the uh, the introduction. I'm going to share my screen here and uh, let me know if, if you all see the title slide of the presentation. If so, we can get going, great. All right, well, um, it is an honor to be with you today. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to um, share some of the news of what's happening at Cleveland Hopkins International Airport at Burke Lakefront Airports, the two airport system known as the Cleveland Airport System. So I'm still very much learning about all things Cleveland uh, and that's been quite an adventure. Uh, being a department of the city of Cleveland, that spent a lot of adjusting for me in terms of uh, it being a different type of governance than my predecessor, my previous employer, the uh, Port of Oakland. So I'm sort of just getting into the groove, I think, there. So one thing that I believe is, is evident that I've learned in the last five years is that Clevelanders are extremely passionate, whether that be about um, their sports teams or whether they're East Siders or West Siders. Uh, it's certainly when it comes to traveling, um, and that's what we're here to talk about today, basically. So again, happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to sharing some information with you over about the next 15 minutes. So let's get going. So airports are by design. They're meant to connect communities that they serve to the world through the movement of goods and people. They're centers of commerce. Uh, they're economic engines, and they drive opportunity for critical growth across the impact region. Airports such as CLE have a level of activity which supports thousands of jobs on site, primarily through, in our case, our tenant operators. And so because we are a large airport system, two airport system, there's always a lot going on. And primarily, I'm going to be talking about what's happening at Cleveland Hopkins today. So a few of the things that um, you may have taken note of in your previous uh, recent visits to the airport would include the construction that was uh, underway for a number of months on our smart garage, our green lot. And that project has been completed and opened in the beginning, or reopened fully. 100% spaces are now available as of early October. So we're excited to have that behind us uh, ahead of the upcoming Thanksgiving travel rush. We're going to be beginning a refresh of select terminal restrooms in early 2024. So we're looking forward to that. 
Uh, we did recently successfully conclude uh, lease negotiations with Sherwin Williams for a new corporate hangar facility, which will be loaded on located on the west side of the airport. And uh, at our front door, all of you know, the Sheraton Hotel has now been closed. It will be demolished. We're looking at spring of 2024. And at least temporarily, we're looking to utilize that uh, site to uh, have additional parking for the traveling public. And the biggest thing that's been happening for the last few years is the Terminal Modernization Development Program. It started in 2019 with the master plan process. And uh, we are very much gearing up for what we believe will be a transformational effort uh, to improve the experience for all users. So we've come a long way. Uh, 2025 will be the 100 year anniversary of the airport. But just on the left side of the screen here, what you're seeing is a couple of depictions of the past, the late 20s, the early 30s, and what the airport looked like then. And then on the right, uh, an aerial view of the airport from just a couple of years ago. So a pretty recent view of what Hopkins looks like today. So uh, since my arrival five months ago, I sought opportunities to, um, to share the positive and exciting movement at CLE, not only locally, but also networking with those who can support and expand the footprint of CLE in the aviation industry. So these are just a few examples. And actually, Mar Mary Ann's uh, mentioned about the dust buster came from the uh, How I Wake Up column on Axios that ran, I think, about three weeks ago now. So uh, I'll be looking to do a lot more of those efforts, including being with you here today. So taking a look at uh, historical passenger traffic at the airport over about the last 10 years, 2014, we had about 7.7 .7 million total passengers. We got up to uh, just over 10 million in 2019. And then, of course, we all know what happened in 2020. Um, that had a, a tremendous impact on travel demand. And so traffic went down to about 4 million. But we've been building up uh, since then. Year to date for 2023, we're at about seven, just over 7.3 million total passengers. We are, are, are hoping that we will hit the 10 million passenger mark. And much of that really depends on uh, what happens with demand in the fourth quarter of this year. So here is a, a line graph depiction of uh, where we were in 2019, uh, where we were in 2022, and then uh, where we are hoping to be in 2023. And again, uh, we are going to be flirting with the 10 million passenger mark in 2023 for sure, uh, as long as demand stays strong, which it has been throughout the year. So taking a look at our nonstop route map, the routes shown in green are existing nonstop markets. Uh, the ones that are in green boxes are new markets including San Juan, San Diego, Seattle, which started last year with Alaska Airlines. And then of course, Dublin, which uh, was mentioned in the intro, started in mid-May of this year. And uh, it has done extremely well. We actually had a, a meeting, an event for Air Service Business Development that we attended last week. And Air Service, or rather Air Lagos representatives themselves spoke very highly of the success of the route thus far. Um, and they went so far as to say it's been one of the best launches that they have had in, uh, in their memory. So that's certainly great news, and we're looking forward to a, an expanding relationship with them in the years to come. The markets that are shown in the oval you know, circles there are markets that we do have service to right now, but we think that there's additional demand that could be met through additional service. And then markets shown in red are some of our top unserved markets that we continue to work behind the scenes with uh, the slate of air carriers to consider serving going forward from CLE. Here are our airline partners. We have 10 passenger carriers uh, serving the airport today, and then the two all cargo carriers, FedEx and UPS. So I spoke about the uh, how things are looking in terms of the outlook for the remainder of 2023. So what we have here uh, on the screen is a look back at 2019, 2022, and 2023, focusing on the fourth quarter. So the fourth quarter of 2019, we had just under 3 million total seats available, that seats inbound and outbound. And we had just under 2.5 million passengers filling those seats across 
the three months of 2019 to end the year. And that made for an 82% load factor. Load factor is the percentage of seats that are filled with paying passengers. So pretty respectable load factor there. Um, I'd say it, it's rather strong. Uh, so in 2022, similarly, the load factor was about 80%. Uh, seats were down from 2019 at just over 2.7 million. And total passengers for the quarter were just under 2.2 million. And again, that yielded an 80% load factor. So for 2023, the projections based on all the information that we have right now, all the flights that are out there for sale through the end of the calendar year, we should be at about 3.3 million total seats. So you do the math, that's about a 10% increase over the seats that were available in fourth quarter 2019. If we have a similar load factor to what we experienced in 2019 and 2022, we think we'll see just under 2.7 million passengers across the three month period. If that happens, we should hit or slightly exceed 10 million passengers for the year. And so um, that's something that we're watching very closely. Again, it really comes down to demand, uh, but we have seen some days, just so you know, we've seen some days this month that have been nearly as busy as the busiest months in the peak summer travel season. So if, uh, if that continues, then I think we stand a good chance of, uh, of realizing the 10 million passengers for 2023. And, and that certainly would be a milestone because Again, that was the level that was reached in 2019. Clearly we were on an upward trajectory with passenger activity increasing over several years. And then with COVID, uh, there was a large correction. So, so that would sort of state that we're back and we're looking forward to growing even further uh, beyond 10 million passengers. So in terms of what we're, what we're focused on uh, behind the scenes right now through the master plan effort, this is just a component of the master plan, uh, a chapter of that airport Bible, if you will. And, uh, and that is focusing on the terminal modernization development program. So this really is our path to the future. Uh, it will transform the way that you all know uh, air travel to be in and out of Northeast Ohio via CLE. It is going to be a multi-year effort, um, partially because of the fact that we're we're sort of rebuilding the house while we're living in it. Any of you that have done renovations or additions to your homes, you, you know what that was like. So um, it will take longer because it's not going to be a facility that we build on what's called a greenfield, just ready for development, currently undeveloped parcel. Um, we're going to be reconfiguring uh, our facility within the existing footprint. So what we call PAL2, which is PAL stands for planning activity level. So uh, this is what we'll be looking to achieve across about the next eight to nine years. Uh, we will be renovating Concourse A. Uh, we will be building a new Concourse B, replacing the existing Concourse B to the immediate left of the, the new Concourse B. We will be building a new Concourse E, and then we'll be expanding on the main terminal. Uh, primarily to provide additional square footage for TSA screening, as well as for uh, queuing for airline check-in space and other services that happen on the ticketing and baggage claim levels. So those are the primary components uh, for the terminal facility itself. On the land side, meaning in front of the terminal, we also are anticipating the creation of a new consolidated rental car facility. Uh, which we are hoping to include some additional public parking as well. So you see that depicted as D and E and the sort of orangish brown uh, boxes there in the foreground. And there'll be some other improvements also uh, that will happen across the, the span of the PAL2 improvements. We are hoping to, uh, to begin these improvements in uh, the latter part of 2025, beginning of 2026 and they will extend into the early 2030s. So I'll quickly show you what the remainder of the program uh, would, would yield. Uh, PAL3, so that's the next step. And this is really gonna be dependent upon uh, demand continuing to be strong, but PAL3 would see the creation of a new Concourse C with 14 gates 
and there would be some renovations to the existing concourse C, the gates that would remain there. Uh, there would be a lot of work happening in the, the land side area, further expanding parking options, uh, realigning the roadway into and out of the airport, and further expanding the, the main terminal facility uh, on both the arrivals and the departures levels. And then the final phase would replace uh, what's currently known as Concourse C with a new Concourse D, and there'll be a bit more work happening on the land side of the facility, but the primary addition for PAL-5 would be replacement of the existing Concourse C with a new Concourse D. Very preliminary high level numbers here, but for, for PAL-2, again, that's the renovation of Concourse A, the replacement of Concourse B, and the creation of a new Concourse E along with some improvements to the main terminal building. Uh, that's looking to be about $837 million, uh, but you know we, we think that um, when we include some of the other improvements uh, that would happen on the land side component of the airport, we're talking about more than $1.1 billion of investment. And then when you add in PAL-3 and PAL-5, that's another $1.8 billion that would be invested through the, uh, the balance of the 2030s, Again, much of that is gonna be driven by the, the demand uh, remaining strong for air travel here at Hopkins. And so the total for the entire program is just about $3 billion. So again, uh, this is sort of where we are right now in that effort. We are gonna be uh, ramping up our advanced planning efforts. We just brought on a new executive management consulting uh, firm called the Pasley Group. So uh, they are assembling their team now, their local team. We'll be working very closely with them going forward. Over the course of, of the next year, we'll be also working with the FAA to gain final approvals uh, for the master plan document. And um, we're looking for, for that to be a completed process by sometime next year. Also, as it relates specifically to the Terminal Modernization Development Program, uh, the environmental component that is a required effort, uh, federal effort. We expect to begin that in the spring of next year uh, in support of gaining clearance, which would allow us to proceed with construction uh, likely in spring of 2025. And then we'll be doing some miscellaneous efforts that will uh, prepare us for that major project work to begin. Uh, that should be starting uh, next summer, fall, and then that will go through the end of the decade. Uh, PAL-2, we're hoping to begin the uh, top of 2026, likely go through the end of 2031, and then the PAL-3 through five uh, levels of the program would begin after that and would likely conclude at the end of the decade. So a lot of work to come, a lot of time and effort uh, will be spent, a lot of information will be shared with the public, um, so, so look for that. One thing we're going to be doing in the next uh, few months is launching a new newsletter. And that is, um, that's something I'm looking forward to. And I came up with the, uh, with the name, so hopefully you like it. It's going to be called the, what is it called? The Hopkins Approach. Approach is in you know, approaching aircraft. So, one of my team members came up with something similar and I thought, well, what's another take on that? The Hopkins landing, as I think what they said. I said, how about the Hopkins approach? I like that. So anyway, that's what we've come up with is the Hopkins approach, uh, but look for a lot, uh, a lot of efforts that um, we'll be making to share information and talk about all the exciting things that are happening at the airport. And uh, we hope that you're excited as well about all the, uh, all the efforts that we have planned to make your travel experience better going forward. So thank you for, uh, for being here today and for the invitation. It's an honor. Brian, thank you so much for sharing all that's to come with Hopkins. Certainly. As you've been here and starting to hear from constituents and stakeholders, what are some of those most cited requests that they're looking for in the airport? So I think they want it to, to be an easy flow. Um, one thing that we hear about that I mean, I've seen myself, we can see bottlenecks happening at TSA 
And that's something that we, we really don't want to see happening on a regular basis. Right now, it's sort of what we have to work with. Uh, so we're doing the best we can there. But at the busiest times, the line for TSA is sometimes uh, fusing with the lines for airline check-in and people get confused. And so, uh, so, so that is an unfortunate situation that we're gonna continue to find ourselves in. Um, and we'll do the best we can with our airline partners and members of my team to try to keep those lines separated and to keep, keep things moving as smoothly as possible. But that's a big part of it, I think, is they want, they want to see a smooth and easy uh, experience from the time they exit 237 until the time they get on their airplane and the same in the reverse. So there's a whole host of things that are included in that, obviously, but ultimately that's what they want. They want to be more modern. They want more, more light. They want to be more spacious. They want you know, more services, more modern amenities, and they want it to continue to be, to be easy. Uh, and I do think that you know, what we're going to create is a travel experience that will be uh, exciting for people and it will be um, something that, that they can all be proud of and look forward to uh, making use of as the improvements begin to be implemented. As you think about the driving demand for both business and leisure travelers, what are some of the strategies that you're applying to help boost that demand? So uh, in terms of, of boosting demand, what we really work to do is, um, is have ongoing conversations with our airline partners. And when I say our airline partners, I don't just mean those who are flying here today, but also those that we are sort of aspiring to see uh, flying to Hopkins in the future. So a lot of it is, is demographics, uh, information, um, data that we can uh, get access to that speaks to people's propensity to travel, that tells sort of where people are going, um, especially if there are some markets that we don't currently have service to, but the demand is respectable. And typically with new service, you have um, a uh, sort of an, an influence, a positive influence on uh, the demand for that service. So the numbers will likely be higher than the data that we have that suggests, you know, is in the market today. So it's sharing that kind of information, any sort of um, info for the business community in terms of uh, new companies coming to the area, companies expanding, things that mean jobs uh, that would sort of naturally lend to a need for business travel, those kinds of things. And so also keeping very close to what's happening what's happening throughout the industry with airlines, with their fleets, uh, with how they are, are operating their various hubs, um, the types of moves that they're making when they ship service downward. You know, maybe that's an opportunity for us when they introduce service to a market that we think is similar in some ways to ours. Maybe we think we have a better opportunity to sort of get in there and tell our story again. So it's a multifaceted approach. Um, but it's one that we are constantly working at behind the scenes. So there's there's always discussions happening. There's always communication going back and forth between us and uh, a, a long list of, of air carriers. Can you speak to what, if anything, the airport is doing to support the growing advanced air mobility industry and ensure safety in the airspace with drones? So, you know, advanced air mobility is something that's still developing. So it's it's quite difficult to be honest with you, for airports to have a clear path on how they can accommodate um, an aircraft segment that has not really largely shown itself in the market today. Drones are a different story. Drones are not allowed uh, above or around the airport. So, so that's something that, that you know, airports work very closely with the, with the FAA on. Um, but in terms of advanced air mobility, and these new aircraft types that are being developed, uh, that are being pushed on uh, on the market in terms of new opportunities to travel, new ways to travel, uh, aircraft that can take off vertically. Well, you know, that's a big question of will they even use airports? Um, and so, what we'll be looking at as we advance through the planning effort for the terminal modernization development program is, you know, how can we prepare sort of being Flexible, uh, that's a word that you'll probably hear me say a lot over the next few years, but but how can we maintain flexibility so that we can incorporate uh, the, the types of um, 
components to our service and our facilities that will allow us to more easily accommodate um, not only those types of aircraft, but any other uh, new sort of things that come along that we need to be not only aware of, but to uh, to make a, uh, a easy way to accommodate within our facility. So electrification is going to be a big thing going forward um, in the parking facilities, in our um, our rental car facility, uh, throughout the, the terminal facility. So we'll be looking very closely at those needs in terms of, of what the demand is for uh, for power load and what we need to do to ensure that we can accommodate all of those needs. As you look ahead to embark on this master plan, what do you see as some of the major challenges that's going to be faced with implementing the plan? So one of the biggest things uh, for me is that we're we're seeing more and more people traveling through Hopkins. And so we are um, we're going to be faced with, uh, an existing facility that is inadequate in many ways, um, that that is limited, that is aging. And so we have to find ways to um, sort of hold things together as we're simultaneously planning to make uh, far reaching improvements for the future, um, trying to keep people calm, uh, but also excited. <laughs> so, so I think what what can um, what can help with that is people actually seeing things physically happening. It it will be stressful. I think at times it will be a challenge to to use the airport. There's there's going to be no way around that. But as long as we continue to tell uh, the right story, so that they understand, everyone understands what it is uh, that is our our end goal. Um, and that is for an improved, a drastically improved experience for all travelers. Then I think that you know people will hang in there. Uh, they'll tough it out because I think many people have been waiting, waiting for and wanting this to happen for a long, long time. I know many people uh, on my team have been. So I'm excited about it, but it's going to be a major challenge because I think that uh, that travel demand is going to continue to grow, um, and we're going to have to continue to find ways to. Um, to adapt and also to continue to to plan for and then uh, physically execute on the elements of uh, of the modernization program. So it's going to be a a heavy sort of lift, um, but I'm looking forward to going through it and uh, and to seeing what it what it means, uh, what it what it produces, um, and then how people react to it as the the new Hopkins begins to be revealed. As you think about. Um, what you need to make the master plan happen. What support do you need from those of us on the call, from the community, to make that vision come to life? That's a great question. I think that we we will be um, looking to to have some uh, some meetings across the next couple of years that are more to share uh, how things are coming along in the the planning process, which will include the architectural elements, the design elements, um, sort of the, the nuts and bolts, if you will, of, um, of the improvements that we're looking to make. So I think you know, we, we want to, um, to test the pulse, if you will, take the pulse of, of what the community is thinking, especially those who are travelers, um, and making sure we understand what people are, are looking for, what they're hoping for, what they, they feel should be a part of, of this effort. Um, and, and that I think is, is really going to be the biggest thing is, is just understanding what the community wants, what they need, uh, and, and what, you know, they believe is, uh, is sort of the right combination of improvements to make this the best possible facility for them. Ryan, thank you so very much for your time and uh, the amazing insights that you have shared with us today. We are all really looking forward to the changes and hear you loud and clear that it's a large dose of patience on our part to uh, for them to happen and also to what's going to happen to us while we're waiting at the airport. But thank you for accepting the, ch the challenge to lead us to the next level. We're grateful.